Warning, the following Otaku Generation podcast has content of an adult and mature nature and is not necessarily safe for work or appropriate for children under the age of 18. If you are easily offended by content of this type, please stop this recording. Parental discretion is advised. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Otaku Generation are those of the cast and crew and the individuals that express them and are not necessarily associated with the sponsors or guests of the show. Otaku Generation is a Red Apple production which is solely responsible for its content. All impressions are poorly impersonated. And please, for the love of God, don't try this at home. Hello there! My name's Wichita Rutherford from 5 Minutes with Wichita.com and let me tell you something. I listen to Otaku Generation all the time. They make me laugh so hard and they just are they goofy and geeky but I love them. I can't get enough of them and I'm so proud of them because they done so good. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Hi Tim, this is Wichita Rutherford and we'll see you in well, welcome to Otaku Generation. generation. Next generation radio for Otaku. <laughs> Our podcast brings all the Otaku to the yard. Long, long ago, in a place far away, we said some stuff, did some stuff, made a podcast. To be honest, we didn't pay the whole process a lot of attention. We're still podcasting from OGNetworks.tv in a basement where it's two miles away from the last place. Show number 680, June 20th, 2018, with this week's topic, A Place Further Than the Universe, Sorayomi Tobasho. And now, things cheese sticks weren't made for. Number one, playing drums with. Number two, stilts. Number three, useless for bindle sticks. Number four, hockey cheese sticks? No. Number five, screwing your courage to the cheese sticking place and will not fail? No. And now, someone who might know the answer to the question you're thinking of right now, Alan Chase. Hey, man. How's it going? Pretty good. Pretty good. How have you been? Um, well, I've been busy weekend. I had to work this weekend, Friday night, Saturday mm-hmm. afternoon. and uh, Plowing no, the, the North 40 for fall? I have no idea what you mean by that, but... Uh, it's an agricultural term I, in I which know. livestock is buried in the ground to provide fertilizer for the spring harvest. I, I got that. I just didn't have the literal reverence in mind. So anyhow, hi, hello, everyone. Uh, happy Father's Day, belated Father's Day for all of those where it applies. Yes, for all of our listeners listening yeah. to the recorded version of this as opposed to clairvoyantly spying on us live. Yes, that's correct. Keep, like, forgetting to, like, do the holiday things the week before. Like, now it's too late, so it's sure not last week, and keep doing this. Now, now you're doing just, like, a cruel reminder to people who've already missed it to make them feel worse. Mm-hmm. Hi, hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm Alan. I'm Matt. Ketchup, sporing his otaku generation moo-moo. And Paul, <laughs> he was he was missing you last week, Paul. Yeah. Just said, just said he was like, "Where's Paul?" Because I did this whole bit with the Otaku Generation Moo Moo, and like I sort of flubbed it, so I'm not sure oh. if he kept it. But oh, still, <laughs> stylish and authentic Otaku Generation Moo Moo. What's fresh? What's bang? What's squeak with the OG crew? Indeed, and the Moo Moo. Um, so what did I what did I do this weekend? Um, aside from Father's Day and all the other things, uh, I saw the movie R.I.P.D. Um, I think this was a complete failure in the box office, but anywhere where you could buy it or mm-hmm. rent it was like the prices were super high on it uh, for the longest time. So um, I went and I rented it uh, this weekend, and uh, I quite enjoyed it. Was, was that good. the ghost thing with Jeff Bridges? Yes. Yeah, that was odd. I kind it, of enjoyed it. Uh, did, you, did you watch it? <laughs> I don't it? remember anything about it, but I kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, yeah when so, was that from? That was a few years back now. Yeah, that was yeah. a few years back. But it was always, you know, I don't know. I mean, 2013. Like, ah, okay. This is predates Ryan Reynolds being now famous um, in the in the world of, you know, for Deadpool. But mm. um, he's always been a good actor, and uh, if he's in a movie, I generally will look at it for two seconds, and then Jeff Bridges yep. attached to it is like, oh, maybe. That might look pretty good. Um, yeah, I. who knows? I, I My thought, after all of it was said and done, I go, oh, maybe this was in the complete gap and well of 
um, ghost story like Ghostbusters never coming out and being in in constant development hell and mm. maybe a studio has said well let's do something different and this came out of nowhere. I don't know what its origins or what it's based on. I didn't do any research on it, but I certainly got a laugh out of it. I enjoyed it for what it was. I mean, sadly, it was not a success, so we're not getting any more of them as far as I know. So, uh, yeah, so anyhow, that, that's, that's I think, all that's worth sharing. Um, Matt, what about you? What uh, what went on? Uh, well, this week, the, uh, the new movie from Pixar, The Incredibles yes. 2, came mm-hmm. out. And I went to see it on opening weekend, and it was a lot of fun. I I saw it in a theater that was like 90% full of people who really, really wanted to be there. Um, like, they even applauded the short feature before The Incredibles. They laughed, they cheered, they they gave, like, standing ovations at, like, you know, the appropriate moments at the mm-hmm. plot. They were really into it. See Incredibles 2, highly recommended. Everything from the original Incredibles you liked and then new stuff. I mean, I remember, I recall my commentary about the last film where people were like, oh, did you like Incredibles? It, it's self-titled. It's pretty incredible. I really enjoyed the first one. I suspect that I will enjoy the second one whenever mm-hmm. I get a chance to see it. Yeah. Um, one of the interesting things about The Incredibles was when you sit down and analyze the first movie, the big threat of the movie is not, well, there is a particular supervillain that needs to be defeated. But the supervillain scheme is not your typical thing of, oh, I'm going to rob a bank. I'm going to, uh, you know, hold the world hostage with a nuclear weapon or I'm just going to conquer the world. It was it was sort of an existential philosophical quest to destroy the whole idea of superheroes, ironically enough, by empowering everybody who was not a superhero to be a superhero. That's that's kind of the interesting thing, I think, that that sets The Incredibles apart from like other super movies, the uh, the whole idea of, you know, performing heroic acts and thwarting particular individual crimes is kind of secondary to just the whole idea of like having superheroes exist in the first place. That's that's kind of an interesting uh, like worldview that that sets it apart from from other superhero movies in my humble opinion. So let's see what else can I say about this? It's doing really good at the box office, which apparently will uh will will help uh Disney which owns Pixar now because the Han Solo movie has apparently been very soft at the box office. Hooray for uh, Incredibles 2. But us catch up. I was so worried about Disney not having enough money. Yeah. Please, won't you think of the giant mega national corporations? Please, now more than ever. Okay, I'll start off with this week was E3. Nothing really particularly exciting or anticipation worthy, I think, really was announced what is this E3? year. It's the Electronic Entertainment Expo. It's when the big game companies announced their upcoming big game stuff. Oh, oh, it's like what's hot in video games for the next year. Yeah, essentially. Except there wasn't really particularly that much that I thought. I mean, yeah, it's usually a trade and hype show. Actually, it was totally off my radar this year, so I know nothing about what got announced. Um, uh, so much. Um, but yeah, I yeah, I don't know. I mean, there was it was like a flood of only thing you could see, let's say, on YouTube or on Twitter uh, during basically that week. So, um, in terms of games, I don't know. I mean, Bryce is probably the only one who would highlight. Oh, there was a Jump Force, which I pointed out to Bryce. Mm. Um, that was happening when last time we recorded a show, um, which is um. The mega combination of Naruto, Dragon Ball, and um, a One Piece, and a and, and a secret. Uh, it could be good, but I know Bryce has been uh, unimpressed by the quality of One Piece games to date. So, yeah. <laughs> well, he he had a pretty good response at the end. He's like, "Oh yeah, this looks pretty good." So, okay, well, that's, that's who knows? Thing. But I mean, it's not it's not available for PS4. It's only available for Xbox. No, I think it's also a PS4 thing. It was just that oh. was announced during the Xbox. Uh, got it. Thing. Got it. Yeah. So so there you go. That's maybe a highlight for somebody. So get their facts straight. Personally, I mean, they announced another. Um, Super Smash Brothers, but it's going to essentially have all of the roster from all the previous games. The um, Fire Emblem looked kind of interesting. Like, Japan only, either NES or Super NES or actually Famicom, but it didn't get released in the U.S. until the Game Boy Advance version. It just kind of looked neat. Console or handheld? 
Oh, I think it's the Switch, so it's both. both or ne- yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Go Google E3 and then check out the press conference. The only thing that kind of was interesting was the, there's a uh, smaller company called Devolver, and they had like a pre-recorded press conference, and it's mostly like snark than an actual press conference. Like their hey. um, loot box coin. <laughs> Devolver does good sort of hyper-violent indie games a lot of the time. You know, I think they do good the, stuff. Or one of the games was uh, My Friend Pedro, I think they announced, which was uh, sort of 2D run and gun. Very ah, stylish. Okay. They're also going to be finally a English um, release of Male Wolf Chaos. That was originally an original Xbox game. But Oh, I think I did see that one across one of my feeds. Yeah. Cool. So, um, and there are a number of sequels. I think that's kind of why sort of zoned out. Gotcha. Like, the Xbox One had like almost 40 or 50 games in a row just in a very quick presentation, succession, mm-hmm. stuff like that. But they didn't announce any new hardware. And again, I, some of the games looked nice, but it was just nothing that felt like anything truly unique. Like even the stuff that was not a franchise that already existed just felt like a remake of a game that already exists just with a different IP attached. Gotcha. Like they're redoing, or this mm-hmm. is a good example of that, but just one thing that came to mind is that they're remaking Resident Evil 2, but with like really nice graphics. Yeah, I, I th- that's something they started doing a while ago. Isn't like they're a Tomb Raider game, which is basically just the original Tomb Raider, but with like contemporary generation graphics and models and that sort of thing? I think I did see that announcement, too. Yeah, I was yeah. never a Tomb Raider fan back in the day. Yeah. So. Well, some of the studios were announcing the um, for the next gen, mm. right? And that's why there were some rumors about, oh, okay, there's going to be a PS5 and, and you know, an Xbox 2. Or nothing or was Xbox officially one, two. announced. Yeah. That was mostly just rumors because yeah. people just have feeling that it's about damn time type of deal. But right. nothing official about any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Just that it seems the most logical thing since the PS4 and Xbox are getting kind of long in the tooth at this point. So, talking about disappointing things, I'll move <laughs> on to... FLCL sequel. I forgot to mention oh, this really? a couple of weeks ago. Oh, but I need to check that out. It's... Yeah, it's been airing on Saturdays yeah. on Cartoon Network. I, you're it, you're unimpressed. It sounds like. Or if it was just the anime by itself, now I don't think I'll be necessarily as harsh on it. Ah. But when you take it in context, you fully cool the. It's kind of like shitting on the material that was based off of. Like, it's more ah. derivative than building up on gotcha. it. Gotcha. Oh, that's a disappointment. So, that's pretty much all I'll say. I mean, two eps- or three episodes at this point have aired, but I finally watched two so far. Is I, it a full, full core? I think it's six episodes for Progressive, and then six episodes for Alternative. So, Progressive is season two, and Alternative is season three. Gotcha. Hmm. But I think they're supposed to show one after the other. So technically, I have actually seen three episodes because for April Fools, they did they showed the first episode of the third season, but that's unconnected for the most part to the second season, as I'm supposed to not know. I mean, as far as I, I mean, if they do tie, it's not in the first episode that things clearly tie. I mean, still might as well check it out if you're a fan. But at the same time, I'll probably think poorly on anyone who thinks this comes anywhere close to the original, as far as writing quality or even animation mm-hmm. oh and to finish it up for my movie of the week to round up the trifecta of disappointment it's all dogs go to heaven too actually i was going to say segue into another animation that shits on its source material it's all <laughs> dogs go heaven too ow ow harsh where, harsh botas yeah where charlie comes back from the dead and because like the big so that sounds like it would it would rather undercut the 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 premise of the first movie, whereas he goes to heaven. Yeah, and the whole thing's about like the whole self sacrifice or whatnot thing. And mm-hmm. uh, Scratch gets adop- adopted by the little girl, if I remember correctly. It's been a while since I've seen the original All Dogs Go Heaven. It's on mm. my pile of things to rewatch. But anyway, so the thing essentially starts out with Charlie waiting for Scratch to come to heaven like he's supposed to die that day. That's a really morbid way mm-hmm. to start. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of the things I've always had kind of a problem with with these supernatural life after death movies is that you do realize we are rooting for the little girl to die in this movie <laughs> yeah. here, right? You know, 
She can so she can be reunited in death with her beloved whatever. Or Scratch is the doll com- friend, best friend of Charlie, not the little girl. Well, yeah, not this particular movie, but it's just like all these movies where where like you have supernatural beings popping in from the afterlife. Guaranteed, somebody's gonna bite it in this movie. Yeah. It's either gonna be the main character, and it's gonna be like the the like the apotheosis of their of their character arc, or it's going to be a throwaway joke that like some like supporting character gets cacked, but it's okay because they're now an angel or a ghost or something. Yeah, yeah that nicely adds to the crapitude of it. Mm-hmm. Also, just the. Uh, fact that it ends with Charlie staying alive so it kind of completely undoes that also he's kind of one of the main reasons why Satan cats or whatever which is just another grown worthy aspect of this movie Satan cats or it, no it's actually just a single cat it's essentially Satan well I knew this already but but they actually come out and say it in a movie they release to the public <laughs> or I don't think they actually call it Satan Cat, but it's essentially Satan, but that's a cat. I forget gotcha, what the gotcha. character's actually named, so I'm just going to call it Satan Cat because that's what it actually is. Just, mm-hmm. There's this horn that will open any door, and Satan Cat wants it so that it can like get all the dogs and dog heaven to be trapped in its personal hell or something like that. I, I, I think you pick movies. I, I think the theological underpinnings of this whole franchise are just extremely suspect and ill-considered. I also think your movie choices are, are you know, self-inflicted and ill-considered. <laughs> or, I saw that was I, – when I went to uh, make a DVD of – because it was on air – of Over the Hedge and Stuart yes. Little, which I still have to get to watching. Like, I'll get into why I want to watch Stuart Little mm-hmm. when I actually finally get around to watching I it. understand that's actually good. It and is. then there's a bit of space. Like, I chopped off the commercials, and I had enough room on the DVD for a third movie. I saw that All Dogs Go Heaven was airing like that. Yeah, so you're going like, okay, Talk Animals theme. Let's let's do that on one disc. Or, yeah. or All Dogs Go Heaven, the original one, is decent. It's one mm-hmm. of the Sir Don Bluth classics that, if yeah. you're a fan of 2D animation, you should probably check out some point in your life. Yeah, Don Bluth rocks. Yeah. But after All Dogs Go Heaven, there was All Dogs Go Heaven 2. And I don't think I've seen or didn't think I'd seen it before. So it's like, I might as well watch. I expect it'll be crap. At least I've watched mm-hmm. it. And right, right. I didn't put it on the DVD, but I recorded it onto the DVR. Mm-hmm. Like with All Dogs Go Heaven, like it stopped and then recorded the other thing just to watch it. And then I did watch it. And since I was on the theme of disappointment, I decided to mm. talk about it and tell you, watch the original All Dogs Go Heaven, avoid All Dogs Go Heaven too. Even if you have a little kid, just yes. there's better crap out there. If you too. want to watch a good sequel, see John Wick 2. That's <laughs> good. All right. I guess that puts another spin on the All Dogs Go to Heaven. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did not even realize that. Ouch. Um, before I forget, uh, New Polymatic came out, and also New Con Luke came out on Sunday. So there's that. Also, before I forget, because I'm going to forget, I at least put on Twitter uh, access to the Discord server. Uh, you know, Brace is in there. I'm not sure he's active in it, but I figured we at least we used to sort of had um, a form and stuff in the past. Uh, with the Moon Masters forum, right? So I thought, all right, why don't why don't we do stuff? Because people want to talk to us for whatever reason. You know, you can hang out there. Plus, you can so, do voice. So, stuff. what is Discord? It's some sort of like video game voice chat service. It is basically just that, and uh-huh. you can do voice and video on it. Uh-huh. You can stream on it, um, but also there's it, you know as text channels like we have Slack. This is more focused on gamers mm. um so if let's say paul you wanted to set something up and you know promote some conversation and schedule a thing and play a game and stream princess peaches tic-tac-toe challenge right and people wanted to you know whatever it's available for for our uses i also thought um i'm not doing it right now but i thought about maybe taking this live live recording and just kind of output that right into you know one of the voice channels so you know others could could hear it gotcha yeah so you know i don't know something it's it's out there check the twitter feed um there are invites they have limited numbers if they fill up which they probably won't but if they do um i'll i'll just put out a new invite on twitter 
So that was it. I just want to talk about that. Cool. Okay, Paul, what about you? What's been going on? Let's see. What's been going on? So this weekend was week four of my typewriter repair course. Oh, yeah. How's that going? <laughs> One more to go. We are are you finding it edifying? Uh, I am, yes. Oh, so good. <laughs> we've been poking around in the innards, and now we are in the process of reassembling the typewriter. Ooh. So... And I discovered very quickly that it was important to bring my own pair of gloves because these people have an extremely ha uh, casual attitude towards cleaning chemicals. Ooh. Oh, I got you. So. Yeah. Well, I imagine there's um, a lot of grease that goes into lubricating mechanical typewriters. Mm, yes. Just so long as you keep it off of, like, you know, the type face. Yeah. And there's a bunch of chemicals that, you know, basically are good for cleaning one part of the ty uh, typewriter and will totally destroy another part of the typewriter. <laughs> Uh, this group is not necessarily the most careful I've seen on the restoration front, but still it's interesting getting in there, poking around, uh, seeing how all the mm -hmm. engineering works. So there is a lot of engineering that went into mm -hmm. these things. Yeah. Okay, cool. So they had a, they were demonstrating a, a model of an, the Oliver, which is yes. an early typewriter that has sort of these um, semicircular shaped bars, kind of like one of the loops of the McDonald's arch. Mm -hmm. and they come and, and strike it from either side. They're, it's a, just a beautiful oh. piece of machinery hmm. mm. and uh, very well machined. So what else? Uh, this weekend I also went out to, in the direction of Harrisburg to a fiber arts festival. <laughs> fiber arts Fiber festival? arts weaving. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about fiber optics or no, something no. like that. No, no. So this is uh, weaving and uh, wool and that kind of thing. Okay. And uh, the best thing I saw there, well, one, first of all, there was a... Um, an exhibit of uh, Japanese-style embroidered balls mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, called Temari. Um, I had never heard of these before, and mm -hmm. they are absolutely gorgeous, I have to say. Uh, it's worth searching them online. Is uh, it like precision Japanese weaving? Uh, it's not so much uh, weaving as you see. It's basically a, a small hand-sized ball wrapped in thread, mm -hmm. and they are done in very elaborate geometric patterns. Oh, Okay. Um, and uh, some of them are just uh, absolutely gorgeous and intricate. Okay. Uh, but, but another thing that was very cool was a, a uh, hand-operated automatic sock knitting machine. <laughs> <laughs> and this thing was fantastic. <laughs> it's just like this, uh, this. It looks like an, an old sewing machine yeah. in terms of when it was manufactured, except it's this circle with all these little hooks. Uh -huh. that come up and you turn a crank and the hooks go whoop around the circle and they pop in and out and they make this stretchy um, circle of yarn out of whatever. Oh, neat. So um, sadly, I did not have as much time there as I would have liked, mm -hmm. but I have to say I'm absolutely in love with this automatic sock knitting machine. <laughs> Does does it actually have a mechanism for like making the the ankle bend, or do you have to do that manually? No, you have to do that manually. Ah. So the the demonstrator uh, from a very well known um, sort of antique sewing equipment restoration company called Bobbin Boy mm -hmm. uh, was demonstrating the use of this thing, and she she showed so there's a whole bunch of hooks around the outside, and she demonstrated how if you just use like five of the hooks, it'll make this cute little circle like just the size of your finger. It just ah. uh, takes up the tension automatically. Nice. And she was happily, like, ripping out, you know, stitches in the middle of things. So I would imagine what you do is as you hit the right point, you, like, rip out some of the stitches and then, like, just sew in another bit of heel or something. Mm, okay. Uh, because, yes, I think uh, just a, a knitted tube sock would not be the most comfortable. Uh So, yeah. So that was uh, an entertaining weekend. That's, that's definitely going to go on my... Uh, list of uh, activities to do in the summer because oh. they do, do a very nice job there. Okay. And what else? So it hasn't been much gaming lately, I have to say. But on the anime front, um, so I'm not quite caught up with Golden Kamui, the um, sort of turn-of-the-century adventure story uh, in Hokkaido. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, continuing to be a really good show. Um, oh, good. Yeah, I like the pacing. It's holding up. Um, I imagine this is going to be at least a two-core show. I'm hopeful it has like a run of two cores as opposed to just trickling off at the end. I haven't really dug into the source material to see how much they have to adapt. Uh, but so far, it's uh, really good stuff. It's a, a cracking show. Um, so Megalobox, I am not quite current of that. I think I'm one behind, but still enjoying that. 
Yeah, a lot of people in. punching other people. I think there's a bit more going on. I mean, drama wise and whatnot. Well, yeah, but it's all in the service of people punching other people, so you can feel feel good about watching it. But no, I mean, really, it's the, the, all the politics are about. Well, you know, this guy, you know, just isn't up to the business because he thinks this is the right way to punch people, whereas we all know <laughs> this is the real way to punch people. So we're talking, of course, about their 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 gear that they wear, which are the sort of. Uh, mechanical arms that handle mm. the punching and the, the the bad guy who wants to take over the the bad corporation run by the other bad person uh, believes that his AI gear is the the way to win all the fights and he is proved wrong by our plucky protagonist and his lack of gear. So I'm very curious to see if he will don gear for the big megalo box competition that's coming up. There's also Megalonia. The- whole thing with the um, underground rate fights and all that stuff. I imagine that's going to be coming back in at the end where our hero will be pressured to throw the big match against the champion. Uh, Yes, that Chekhov's uh, gun is is squarely placed on the mantle. Uh, Anything else? Oh, Hinamatsuri. Hinamatsuri is continuing to be just a nice show that you aren't quite sure what they're going to do with each new episode. Oh, that's always a pleasant change. Yeah. Uh, It's got a sort of an offbeat sense of humor that appeals to me. Uh, It's quite often I find uh, comedy shows to be a bit of a mismatch with my taste. This one I'm I'm continuing to enjoy. Yeah, I consider this my top show of the season. I am current with this one as well. Oh, cool. Uh, What's the current? Is it 10 or 11 that we're on? Uh, I don't remember the actual number. I just remember what happened and the fact that it ended with a bit of a cliffhanger. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so um, I think this is this is looking like it's probably going to be a single core show. Yeah, to my knowledge, it's a single so, core. So uh, this is probably a good one to talk about uh, once it wraps up and we go into next season. What else? Uh, Major Second is actually a pretty good sports show. I'm enjoying this one. Um, it's continuing to, you know, I mean, it's it's a standard shonen sports show. So you know, you have your your plucky protagonist and he's his underdog team, and his, you know. The, somewhat grumpy upperclassmen on the team you know are they going to be able to come together instead of trying to win the game on their own and you know stop running down their teammates and uh, the the, the pitcher who just thinks everybody else is trash has said well finally said you know well if i have to flatter my incompetent teammates to you know to win maybe that's what i have to do (laughs) you know if the pitcher is good enough you don't really need fielders yeah like ever well yeah that's what he thought until inning six and he starts to get tired <laughs> so anyway i mean you know this this is not a, a a great work of art by any means but you know if you like the the shonen sports formula it mm-hmm. is a, a very pleasant uh, incarnation of that mm. um so gurizani that's the baseball gambling one i'm actually really enjoying that as sort of a quiet um it's not really a drama, I'd say, because our main character doesn't really change over the course of an episode. Mm-hmm. It's much more, you know, these little sort of vignettes about this is an aspect of the business. And there's also this this woman who appears in the opening credits and the closing credits, um, who's very sort of drawn in an idealized manner, quite obviously. Mm. But uh, we're up to episode like 10 or 11, and our protagonist has not yet met this woman. <laughs> And if he did, she didn't actually get any screen time. So I'm, I'm not sure if she's just there to uh, to, to fool you during mm. the, the titles or if she features more prominently in the manga. She is the spirit of baseball. Mm. So I I think she, my guess is she probably works at a restaurant where our hero Bonda eats at some point. And, they, and, and she does appear to be a baseball fan from the hat she's wearing. Uh, but in general, um, this is uh, the kind of show that appeals to me, one that sort of gets deep into one particular niche and takes it very seriously. Mm. And even if you might not have a natural interest in that niche, uh, sort of the attention and care they give to it is, is often pretty illuminating. So anything last to mention? I guess the last one I'll mention is uh, Steins Gate Zero. Okay. Uh, which is the the... the most recent entry in the Steins Gate franchise. I guess it's the second series uh, based on the sequel game alternate ending oh, of okay. Steins Gate. And it's been a little uneven for the last few episodes. Uh, they've sort of fallen back into the sort of tedious fan service and annoying character interactions that sort of, sort of were 
my least favorite part of the original series. Uh, uh, but they haven't really like spent a lot of time in there. There was like a week episode, then they st- keep pulling it out at the end. Um, so I'm enjoying it. It's interesting. Um, I don't know. I'm. I'm. They they've definitely raised the stakes very high in this one, uh, with with World War Three pending in all possible world lines. Hmm. So this is not a happy and upbeat show by any stretch. Hmm. And you know our protagonist uh, Kyoma is. Uh, Oh, come on. Uh, I'm losing, losing track of names here. Anyway, our protagonist, uh, mad scientist, uh, former mad scientist now, since he wears a suit all the time and is just an ordinary college student, uh, is definitely uh, still feeling the PTSD pretty hard. Uh. So, But we shall see. I'm enjoying it. It's a strong, strong entry this season. I think it's supposed to be too core. Oh, is it? Yeah. I would not be surprised. Uh, there's uh, there's plenty there. That's, I think, how long the original series was. Yeah. I'm not surprised they're trying to match that. And, yeah, so I still have not made it back to watching any of uh, Full Metal Panic, Invisible Victory. Um, I've only seen the first episode of that. So that's one on my list that at some point I will need to get to this season. Mm. I guess you didn't get around to watching Otaku, the uh, Love is No, Hard not yet. Not yet. I keep There's enough going on this season that uh, sort of my viewing time gets burned up during the week with uh, the few I've mentioned. And I think the other one that I was watching is uh, Isekai Isekaya, hmm. uh, which is almost indistinguishable from the show we discussed two weeks <laughs> ago. Uh, okay. But, so it's got those live action sequences, though. It still has the live action sequences, and they're still they're still what they are. So there's no denying that. So some of them do look pretty tasty, though. Hmm. <laughs> All righty. Well, that's enough for me. Okay. Uh, then we'll run a break. We got nothing else to do in this first first part. Uh, so we'll be back in just a moment. Hi, this is Bernhard, unofficial staff babysitter for Otakon, and you're listening to the Otaku Generation podcast. Look, kids, a radio-controlled Pikachu! And we are back from break with this week's topic, which is... A place further than the universe. Okay, what do we need to know? Where shall we start? The title's a lie. It does not take place in space. It doesn't. It's not no. about a space club in the school. It's a metaphor. Yeah. I feel already betrayed. (laughs) Um, What what this is about is actually um, a group of four girls who, for various reasons, want to go to Antarctica. And it's a relatively realistic show, so it's not a case of, you know, jump in your, you know, magic Sailor Moon mecha and fly to Antarctica and fight the aliens there. It's, It's like we have got to figure out some way to get on the icebreaker that takes supplies to the Japanese expeditions to Antarctica once a year. And uh, it's it's mostly about these girls meeting up, forming relationships, and sort of beginning to understand what it is about making this trip that, that drives them emotionally. Um, the, the big protagonist is... The girl who has a mother who vanished on a previous Arctic expedition, um, which realistically means that she's been dead for three years. Yes. Um, but her daughter just cannot seem to to let go of, of the hope that if she just goes to Antarctica, mom will still be there. And like she even goes to the whole point of structuring her life around earning enough money to get transit down to Antarctica so she can find her her mom to sending emails to her mom like her mom is like trapped somewhere and just can't respond to her which is kind of sad sort of more the secondary protagonists are mainly watching the show through the other girl who feels sort of this this about her high school life and wants an adventure and then finds mm-hmm. out about the other girls so she's like hey antarctica gives me some meaning of life to go and take her um trip with her deal yes deal. and that's yeah. that's where the the story actually starts is that in episode one we meet our protagonist uh what is that kimuri uh mari mari Ma- mari yeah. and shirase yeah but, but she has like a, a nickname uh, Kimari, yeah. yeah. You're quite right. Okay, so Kimari is a girl who's in her second year of high school. You know, in Japan, it's like three years in high school. So she's 
midway through high school and she realizes she has never done anything exciting or adventurous in her life. She 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 wants to do something, you know, extravagant and adventurous and and you know, rule breaking or something, but she always chickens out at the last moment and sort of scuttles back into her safe, protected routine of being a high school schoolgirl. And interestingly enough, she meets the other girl who's desperate to get to Antarctica in a train station where she is, where our protagonist is yet again wimping out on another chance to like play hooky and do something scandalous. And this girl runs by her to make her train and she drops an envelope. And when she picks it up and chases after her, she can't quite catch up to the girl before she gets on the train and vanishes forever. Or so she thinks. Because when she shows the envelope to her best friend, it is full of money. A million yen, in fact. A million yen, which is, what, $10,000? Right around there, yeah. 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 And it is um, apparently, like, all the... You're not sure what this money is. Is it, like, drug money, or did she steal it, or what happens... And then, fortunately, she realizes that the girl was wearing the same school uniform as her, so she must be a student somewhere in her high school, which is a fortunate break for the second girl because they do actually manage to track her down, and she is, you know, returned to her, has her money returned to her, and then they find out why she was collecting money all this time. Um, So apparently she has, in the three years since her mom vanished, been doing nothing but working every part-time job she could get a hold of as a high schooler um, to save up money to get to Antarctica. And she's become sort of an object of derision to her classmates. And yeah. she herself has devel- developed a strong uh, vein of contempt towards basically everyone else who she sees yeah. as frivolous and not worth bothering with. Mm-hmm. Convenient events is also sort of another thing that happens a lot because there's still two other girls we have to talk about. The one isn't really that much of convenience. It just works at the same place as the other part-time girl is, and then she overhears, which is kind of convenient, and then decides to join in. But the fourth girl, now that one was really convenient because they're having a hard time seeing how they're actually going to get passage on the... Yeah, so the problem with getting on the expedition to Antarctica is sort of the problem that, one, they're all underage, and two, they have no usable Antarctic explorer skills. So, how in the world could they possibly get a trip to Antarctica, even if they could pay their own way? Mm. So, what they discover is that there is a teenage girl who is already going on this expedition to Antarctica because she's an idol star. Mm. And it's some sort of reality to- show um, promotional gimmick. Yeah, it's the first uh, Japanese uh, civilian expedition to Antarctica in a long time, so they're sending along a cute girl in order to drum up public interest. Yes. Except this cute girl is not at all interested in this plan. Yeah. The The backstory on her is that she has been like doing commercials and acting in things, and now she's an idol singer or a model or something. But it's not really so much because of her own volition. It's more like her mother is forcing her into all this crap, and because of that, she doesn't have any friends. And- right, and as a result, she is totally, like, friendless. She has no social skills to speak of. Um, and all the other girls either just want to hang around to, like, bask in her, like, reflected celebrity... Or they're just sort of like, eh, she's rather a dead fish. No point in hanging out with her. Um, So she's got, you know, tons and tons of followers on social media, but no actual friends. Like, seriously, not one girl her age is her friend. And the last thing she wants is to be chucked into a miserable freezing cold boat at the bottom of the world where she can't even pretend that she's socializing normally with other people. Um... So she wants out of the expedition, actually, and all of the other three desperately want onto it. So they they eventually work out a deal where if they sort of, they befriend her, and that gives her the strength to, like, agree to actually go on the expedition, and her condition then is, I need, 
I need these people to like go along so I don't go insane. And this that's, makes it like sound very much like a friendship of convenience, making it seem a lot darker than it is, like portrayed in the anime. <laughs> well, actually, that sort of raises the other point of this, and that is, it is extremely sincere. This is all about friendship and overcoming your personal limits, and it is specifically like the friendship of young girls. Well, not young, young girls, but like teenage girls. And half the time, they're like, yes, we are resolved. We are definitely going to do this. And the other half of the time is like, you go first. No, you go first. I can't go first. Um, so it's a combination of teenage, you know, self-sabotage uh, and teenage untrammeled ambition. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And it does, and the friendships are tested a bit as as the show moves into its second half. Um, not too hard. I mean, it's fairly clear given the arc of this show that things are going to work out fairly well. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I think they do a, a pretty good job developing these relationships. Mm -hmm. um, though that is, of course, what this show is delivering. So if that's not what you're looking for, you're probably going to come away a little bored with it. Mm. Uh, but it's um, I actually really like the pace of this show uh, and the way the characters are set up they are not sort of stereotypes uh, they sort of have a stereotypical aspect to them but they do a good job of sort of fleshing that out as, as it builds up particularly the third girl for example mm -hmm. uh, the one who is just sort of hooks up with them at the convenience store because she overhears she's a high school <laughs> dropout but apparently extremely smart and is looking for you know that perfect thing to put onto her college entrance exam oh okay um, so let's see what else can we say about this show uh, let's talk about the pedigree of this show mm -hmm. it is produced by Madhouse and, yay, for, uh, yay for Madhouse and it's based on I believe a manga Yes. Uh, yes, a seinen manga, in fact. Okay. So. Um, interesting thing, uh, according to Wikipedia, this was co-produced by Crunchyroll, which is kind of an interesting thing because usually um, American anime distributors just, like, license, translate, and then distribute things. But in this case, Crunchyroll has actually, like, gotten into the production end of it a little bit, apparently. And it's interesting that this is the one that they chose to get in on. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how well it did for them. But I think as a uh, sort of a piece of, of well-executed um, anime, hmm. it, it achieves what it was trying to do really well. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing about this is it, it's the backgrounds look very realistic sometimes, like particularly the exteriors. Mm. Like they like they imported a photograph and then sort of like painted over it almost right. to, to make sure they didn't miss any details. Um, another thing they really like to do in the, the art style of this is if you notice, there's sort of like a little halo of backlighting around the hair of the girls in just about every shot, sort of regardless of whether naturalistic lighting would produce that effect or not. Yeah, almost as if the character drawings aren't quite part of the scene. Yeah. But it's, again, it's a very deliberate stylistic choice. It's a choice. very deliberate stylistic choice, and it's interesting and, and I thought somewhat noticeable, but, you know, that's their style. Go for it. And they blink a lot. Hmm? They blink a lot. They blink a lot? Yeah, I thought they kind of blinked a lot. Maybe yeah. that's just me, but when watching it, one of the things that came to my mind is hmm. there's not a lot of actual, like, movement, like, with the characters. I mean, it's not really, like, some sort of big action show, but still. Like, I'm not saying it's animated poorly when it is animated, but there's a lot of times when it's just them sort of barely moving, but they do blink. Mm-hmm. A lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Not a thing I happen to notice while watching this, I admit. But I also watched this one week to week as it was coming out, so, yeah, as and opposed I, to trying to marathon it all at once. Yeah, I, th I think that's the, the worst thing we can say about this, is that it, it, it sort of gets homogenous if you marathon it. This would be a good thing to watch, like, one or two episodes at a sitting, and then sort of, like, let it lie fallow for a week, and then come back and watch another episode or two. Yeah, it has a. Um, it doesn't have a lot of sort of uh, big um, emotional arcs in the middle, mm -hmm. or even very big emotional arcs at all. Though it definitely builds to one at the end. Yeah. So the first half of the show is the girls mostly figuring out how on earth they're going to get to Antarctica, uh, which is mostly which is effectively resolved by the end of the first half, and then the second half is the actual expedition. Yeah. And them coming to terms with what it means to actually be on this ship, you know. And it means lots and lots of hard labor in the freezing cold Indeed. and getting seasick and 
discovering just how annoying your tent mate is. Mm-hmm. Well, allegedly, I mean, in truth, the only person who watched the second half so far has been Paul. And so, yeah. and that's also one thing that, like, we do have to admit to is that he's the only one who can talk about yeah. the second half. But the other thing is, like, you thought that the pacing was good. But since we marathoned it, and also just, which might have been a negative point to it, but just I had a sense, at least at least with me and Elle, and maybe to some degree um, Matt, that mm. we've kind of felt that just went nowhere fast mm. for a long period of time. Well, it, it went nowhere slow, actually. Yeah. <laughs> let's, be, let's be accurate. So, I mean... Yeah. Look, the, the, for any kind of gradual thing that normally happens in, like, a, you know, a normal 23-minute show, something that happens or starts to occur within, like, the first seven minutes, you know, commercial interruptions kind of thing, this took an episode and a half to do something like that, and it was minor. It was revealing a point, um, uh, and, and then... Then we had another iteration of that until we got to the third episode. And then maybe something was indicating what, what the whole point of the plan might be. And then, again, we, you know, we got into five episodes and, um, you know, they finally got somewhere. But it, it took, took farther, a farther long t- amount of time. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, 20 minutes. I mean, it's like that's 100 minutes just to get somewhere with mm. with some actual inkling of why you should continue to watch. It's farther than it, than I think it should be. But if you're into a reasonably okay pace show that um, is just a bunch of people doing stuff with, uh, you know, and, and it's really becomes more about the, not the romance, I don't mean this in a negative way, but like the romance of the friendship going to do, going to Antarctica. And it's less about uh, like some grander mission. And so the pacing is, it's not, it's not tiring. It just doesn't really move that yeah. much. The, the thing is that if you watch the episodes one at a time, every episode has its own plot conflict resolution and, and finale. Mm-hmm. But of course, when you are jumping from that immediately into the next episode, it's sort of like, well, you just reset because we, t- we have another episode to watch now. And we were watching this under... You know, time pressure. We didn't get through the whole series, um, so I, I will admit that that you know after like about four or five episodes, we were sitting there going, and then she stabs her in the back and shoves her <laughs> off a cliff, and it's like a perfect setup for a schoolgirl orgy, which they're totally not going to realize. Mm. You know. Yeah, it, it's worth it's worth noting that the pacing. I don't. I don't necessarily think the pacing is good. I think the pacing is is chosen for a particular effect, and sure. you need to be on board for that. And I think one of I, I think what you're latching onto is that it could have been there should have been a little more emotional meat in the first part of mm-hmm. this show, mm-hmm. um, because what we what we're seeing with all these characters is sort of the setup for the the, t- the individual types of stagnation that they've fallen into, the way they're stuck in their mm-hmm. lives. Right. And so you more or less have an episode showing how each of these characters is stuck. And since you have four characters, you made it effective like episode five. And one of those was how what, the main character, uh, Kimari's friend, is stuck in her life. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you sort of build up to this point. And I, th- I, believe, I think that what, that's one of the things they were trying to do is just show you know, the pressure building up in these lives and how they're going to get out of them. And then the individual sort of revelations yeah. that come th- with each of their, their arcs during the second half of the show. Yeah, and I think that that was a very deliberate choice because you can't just click, 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 snap off subtle emotional states, especially things which emotional states which are about essentially not doing things. Um, well, they get you, excitable you can't just, you, at times. <laughs> well, they get excitable at times, but but overall, the arc of their lives is that they're they're devoting themselves to this mission to get themselves out of their ruts. Um, yeah, yeah. Kimari's stuck basically just being an ordinary kid and tired of it. Yeah. Shirase is um, stuck with, you know, being totally trapped with her history with her mother. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember the third girl's uh, name. Hinata, and, I think. Yeah, Hinata. Yeah, is, is you know, 
had uh, conflict with her classmates and is basically stuck in her life working at a convenience store trying to figure out, you know, what she's going to do next. Yeah, what is my future going to be? And then the, uh, who is the Yuzuki. idol girl? Yuzuki. She's stuck in her, her career as a, basically as a child star. That her mother forced her into. Yeah, that her mother is like, oh, yes, uh, it's it's wonderful, it's wonderful. And in, in a year or two, I'm sure you'll be able to have a moment to rest and make some friends. Yes, I'm certain. Um so you have to establish all of that, and it's part of this show's um, sort of sacrifice on the the altar of realism is that it takes time to to like absorb these these details. And yeah, they have individual goals in each episode, like you know, let's go here, let's try this goofy plan to get on the expedition. Um, but under but to to sort of like get that that underlying understanding of the emotional place they're all coming from that that takes some time and the emotional payoffs don't don't have any weight if you don't establish these things properly at the beginning of the series but the emotional payoffs also don't work if you just don't really give a damn about any of the characters who right, find yourself yeah. not giving a damn that's I, all. I think I think they could have achieved all of what they did in five episodes in three um, you know so mm. like the here's the ber- perfect prime example uh I forget the character's name, but she loses the envelope, right? And yeah. then, then there's a friendship that's formed by finding it. They do that within five minutes, mm-hmm. right? right? So they establish it, they set it up, okay, they move it along, and then they just kind of let go of, of they slow everything down, just kind of slow it down. And again, not not in an exhausting manner. It's just that like they did some little rapid, really good things. And then they just sort of let go of caring about the speed in which they achieve moments. Yeah, but again, I think that's that's sort of um, in the service of realism because these are people who are very stuck in their positions in life, and people who are like that, it's it's enough for them to like do one impulsive thing a month, and you know, then like expecting them to just like wildly follow that up with 12 more impulsive and like wholly heartfelt things right away is is you know straining credulity right. it's it's like enough to try and make a friend have it succeed and then sort of go into that sort of slower consolidating phase mm-hmm. of like actually getting yeah. to know the person but, i mean you as a viewer this is part of the point of why you're present mm-hmm. so um, they're not vesting that time back in as you as a watcher. They're just mm. sort of telling their story at whatever pace they feel like. Um, and again, it's not agonizing. It's just could have moved a little bit more effectively. That, I, that I understand where you're coming from, but I've also seen a lot of shows where the characters just sort of banter back and forth, being like pseudo outrageous, yo, and... Right. And it just like really grates and, on me when that happens. And so they I'm, don't they don't suffer from this. Yeah, I mean, and this I'm willing to true. and I'm willing to give this show a little bit of slack because the girls are naturalistic and sort of realistic and developing a friendship, which is difficult for them. This show is also, to a certain extent, the prisoner of its chosen structure, mm-hmm. which is that these girls are going to spend a lot of time trapped together on a ship. <laughs> so that kind of imposes the structure where you need to get a lot of the exposition out at the front if you aren't going to be doing a lot of flashbacks. Does it get better past episode five? I would say so. Um, definitely it becomes a little more dynamic. Um, mm-hmm. in terms of the emotional arcs which build up and then the final three episodes you get the, the really big sort of it's where payoff. everything starts coming to a culmination yeah, particularly and, and the, the biggest arc comes with Shirase's story mm. the, the girl whose mother was lost in Antarctica oh well, right. necessarily and, yeah. yeah and they do a, a good job sort of showing her building pressure as mm. as they get closer to you know finally visiting the place where her mother disappeared yeah and from what I understand, it's one of these things where she want, she desperately wants to finish her quest, but she desperately doesn't want to finish her quest because mm-hmm. that will that will mean she knows for certain what happened to her mom. And she knows, I think, deep in her heart of hearts that it's not going to be good. But there's something else that gets in there, and that is one of the things she's worried about is that when she finds out it isn't actually going to break the what the the trap that she's caught in mm. that she's still going to be 
you know, just having her life dominated by this one fact. By the loss of her mother. Correct. And as soon as she finds out, she's going to find out one way or the other whether, you know, this thing she's devoted her life to, making it to Antarctica to try to break free, is going to work or not. Mm. Yeah, and that's, that's always horrible. I mean, it's it's sort of the, like, standing on the edge of the high dive syndrome, mm-hmm. where you just stand up there knowing exactly what's going to happen, but still not being able mm-hmm. to jump off. So I appreciated the subtleties in this show. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not that this is, uh, you know, really deep insight, but it does a, a better job than, much better than I expected at first with showing, you know, these girls, making them individuals, uh, making them yeah. not necessarily fully attractive individuals in terms of right. you know being excessively idealized, but fundamentally likable. Yeah, um, they they transcend their their stereotypes a little bit. Yeah, I, I will. Well, I'll give them some credit for not making them the standard you mm-hmm. know high school girl. Uh, what I what was it I was like I was joking in the first like you know fifteen minutes of it. It's like okay, got to find the the drama one, the uh, the upbeat one, mm-hmm. the one who's demure, the one who's got problems and is is uh, like you know aggressively spunky. Like I was looking for the the templates, and I don't know if they completely filled them that way, but they didn't do the like standard four or five that you find in all all anime today that has teenagers in it mm-hmm. yeah yeah breaks out of the database a bit yep. <laughs> in terms of telling a bit more of what they intended to be a dramatic story with a yeah. through line and and, a, and an ending to it yeah okay um what else needs do people need to know about uh well let's see as we mentioned this is co-sponsored by crunchyroll so it is available for streaming subtitled on the crunchyroll streaming site um it's based on a manga, if you watch this and like the manga, or if you are just interested in the manga. I'm not sure if that's translated or not, but it exists somewhere. Female director, Atsuko Ishizuka. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, one I didn't of, of Madhouse's directors. She's okay. been doing a few things over the last few years, uh, including No Game, No Life, which I was not like a super fan of. <laughs> uh, what else? Um, a, a few things. I can't recall exactly her history. I should have looked it up before this. But mm. um, I think she did a, a very nice job, you know, sort of assembling the pieces. Yeah. Was... And actually, now that you mention it, I'm I'm willing to bet that, like, having a female director um, allowed them to, to present uh, female relationships with more fidelity mm. than they might otherwise be done mm. with yeah. a typical male production team. Though it it must be noted that the original manga was indeed male-oriented. It was published in a seinen magazine, Hmm. so which surprised me at first because it isn't necessarily written that way. But again, you can see it's trying to sort of generalize the the feelings the girls have. I mean, it is Mm -hmm. very much about the girls, but the problems, the the, the things they're feeling, uh, you you can relate to if you've been sort of in one of these isolated positions yourself. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the one of the things that that shows up in here is um, female bullying, which is not necessarily the same thing as male bullying, mm. um, because male bullying is more on the order of shoving a geek into the toilet and shaking them till their lunch money falls out of their pockets, whereas girl bullying is more intimidation and, and maliciously spreading rumors that yeah. you know are false about people yep. that you don't like as opposed to tripping them down the stairs. Yeah, and you, and you have been seeing that in a fair number of anime lately to various mm. or lesser extents. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, you're right. This is, I think it's in several of the arcs in this one, which is yeah, there's, interesting. There's the whole issue of like... Um, well, what is what is friendship, and what is the distinction between friendship and like codependency? Mm, yes, very which much. is uh, something that comes up in one of the mid one of the mid episodes, and it's it's just something that that I was thinking, wow, you would never see that in like a guy's show. No, you would never have two guys, you know, experiencing this particular form of conflict. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Well, final thoughts then. Um, on the I, whole, go ahead. No, no, say, no, say. I was just going to say, on the whole, um, I really enjoyed this one. I wish Bryce had been here to see this because I think this one might be up his alley, not necessarily the action side of things, but mm-hmm. he enjoys some of these uh, sort of dramatic shows as well. Um, mm-hmm. If you don't mind the slow pace, which I definitely did not, I think it's worth st- sticking around for. Um, really liked the execution, uh, and the show had a good payoff at the end. I was very happy to have watched this. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I didn't pay any particular attention to music. Um, animation was perfectly fine. Um, and then what else? I don't know. I mean, I think uh, I, I don't have a problem with recommending it, but I don't know who I would specifically. Uh, there's no like immediate template I can imagine this is for. So I don't know if this is an anime club thing. Um, I don't know. It depends on what kind of club you have. Right? I, I think Simon's anime club would like this. You know, like if yeah, your club liked Silver probably. Spoon or yeah. you know, some of these other sort of mm-hmm. teen-oriented or Muyashiman, these sort of team-oriented dramas. Um, yeah. Muyashiman a little less. Maybe that's a little more on the dramatic yeah, it's side. Not a, it's not an action kick-ass show. And if that's how your anime club runs and that's all it is, then obviously that's a, a recommendation against your anime club watching this show. Mm. Yeah, very uh, light on the fan service. So there's oh, basically yeah. no fan service in this show. Yep. Yay. I'm not quite sure how much. I mean, and that's like truly everyone's on board. Like, I really suspect that at least a couple people are going to like be bored to tears by episode like, or then again, I mean, the anime club's not going marathon, the try to marathon <laughs> the whole thing. So maybe if it's only two episodes, uh, Showing there won't be an issue, but... Right, yeah. Yeah, I think one after another is probably not the best format for watching this. Well, if you're not on board, I think it's fair to say that you'll you'll probably be getting impatient before this show gets around to start delivering its payoffs. Yeah. Um, so so if it's good to sort of notice if you're like enjoying watching these characters, because if you aren't, maybe you should watch something else. Yeah. I think if like this was a two-hour movie, I would have been more invested in it, but I just... One didn't really end up feeling that much of a damn about the characters, and two, it just like you said, that wasn't like exhaustingly tiring. But for me, actually, I was truly time feeling. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's a caveat for this. Um, if you find yourself just getting bored and hating it, stop. Um, and if you if you watch it and and you actually, you know, get into the groove of it, I think you should. Make an effort to finish because it does pay off well, mm. apparently, yep. according to Paul. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend yeah. Just, you know, yeah, re- I, staying the course. Like, I didn't personally care for it, but I think it's worth at least trying an episode, see how mm. you feel. But if you're just not feeling it, and then, and then. Yeah, for me, the yeah. No- uh, what sustained me through a lot of the early episodes was just the novelty of these characters not being the stereotypes that I thought they were going to be when I saw the original conception of the show. Ah. Okay, uh, let's see. What else do I have to say about this show? Um, well, one interesting thing for me was that this show is set in Gunma Prefecture in central Japan and not in Tokyo. Mm. Um, it just seems that one of the hallmarks of, of anime is that stereotypical you know, girls hanging around with each other's shows are always set in um, some Japanese high school where they seem to spend very little time in class and most of their time in after-school club activities, just hanging right. around, talking about nothing. And I think this show, you know, deserves a couple of points at least for for avoiding that that whole like narrative trap. Mm-hmm. So, and you can always watch. You don't know Gunma from this season <laughs> to find out the real story about Gunma Prefecture. I don't know. I don't think there's anything particularly fantastic no, about no. Gunma Prefecture, <laughs> no, but it's not uh, no, sponsored no. by the prefecture yeah. like we no. had it with other shows. But it, but at least they they understand that there are like you know places in Japan sticking up out of the ocean besides Hokkaido, Okinawa, and Tokyo. Mm, indeed, indeed. I, don't I prefer that. Japanese version of Rapture, <laughs> the underground city. <laughs> Yes. Or under war, see, I should say. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I chose. This thing is 12 episodes long, yes? 13, and, I believe. Oh, 13. 13, yes. Okay, and then uh, links. So, as mentioned before, it's on Crunchyroll, and you can check out A Place Further Than the Universe. Again, on Crunchyroll at ochilink.com slash 1VDK. Uh, oh. Japanese title is Sora Yorimo Toibasho. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I think it's time for us to wrap up because we're at the end of the show, and you know it would be weird for us just to like say okay, bye, <laughs> and then and nothing. Uh, we've been doing this for thirteen years, you know. So for all the things we mentioned here, please visit our website, 
www.talkgeneration.net and uh, ognetworks.tv. Um, so do we know? I don't know. Maybe some of these, these people in the room here know we're going to watch next week. But I don't, and you don't, and you will find out on Wednesday because that's when we podcast. For feedback, you can always hit us up at otaku.generation at gmail.com or Skype Otaku Generation one word. Um, and uh, if you want to check out the Discord server, um, I at least am on it, you know, in the evening. If you want to chat with me, probably am not the person you want to chat with. But nonetheless, if you want to reach out to any of us, maybe some of us will be in there every once in a while. So, uh, okay, we got an appendage, uh, and we have a fortune, but what's the appendage? Uh, penguin, in be- or if, if Paul actually has a bear, while I was just going to say penguin in between the sheets because, you know, Antarctica. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, this week's fortune cookie to guide you through your upcoming week is a person is not wise simply because one talks a lot. But they all are wise. They have a penguin in between the sheets. I don't know. I feel like I feel like this fortune cookie is like particularly like zinging podcasters here somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, everyone. Have a good week. Does this fortune cookie know this podcast better than it knows itself? <laughs>